Robert Hughes Medical Institute. The 2006 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Potent Biology, Stem Cells, Cloning, and Regeneration, will be given by Dr. Douglas Melton, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Harvard University, and Dr. Nadia Rosenthal, senior scientist at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. The second lecture is titled, Adult Stem Cells and Regeneration. And now to introduce our program, the Vice President for Grants and Special Programs of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Peter Bruns. Well, thanks for rejoining us for these lectures on stem cells. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, I'm going to make a short commercial message here for our other website called biointeractive.org. Uh, I recommend highly that you go to that site and take a look what's there. You'll find all sorts of interactive things, uh, animations, virtual labs, streaming video of previous holiday lectures, and all sorts of links to other places of, of, that are relevant for the topics. Uh, you also on that site can order for free DVDs of any of the uh, holiday lectures. Uh, and as Tom mentioned before, uh, starting next week, we're going to be putting on that site uh, the, the lectures as podcasts as well. So our next speaker is Nadia Rosenthal, who's the lab director and senior scientist at the European Molecular Biology Lab uh, in Italy. It's a reflection of the international nature of science that she uh, has a lab that is uh, full of people from all over the world uh, working on her topic. Uh, and uh, asking how basic science can, can yield uh, medical breakthroughs. Uh, Nadia has long been interested in understanding how muscle cells develop and function, uh, which has led uh, to her interest in regeneration and aging. In her first lecture, she'll focus on the role of stem cells in wound healing and regeneration. So here's a short video to introduce Nadia. <laughs> Obviously, living in Italy is a, a wonderful inspiration, and in fact, as a child, I uh, was obsessed with the Renaissance. So to come back and spend uh, as much time as I possibly can when I'm not in the lab, roaming the churches and looking at the art that uh, just suffuses this, this city in Rome is an absolute delight. A lot of the people in the lab are also really enjoying the fact that we live in Italy. Uh, it hasn't been hard to recruit people to come and work in this lab because of the wonderful city we sit in. I've been aware of the, the responsibility for teaching, and not just teaching, but teaching in a way that is inspiring and is engaging. Uh, it's unfair to ask a young adult to sit and listen to you unless you're telling them something that's really interesting. I find science endlessly interesting, so I have to figure out a way to make it as interesting to the students that I teach. The holiday lectures are a wonderful institution. I've already, uh, in, I think, engaged just about my entire lab uh, in, the, in the project uh, to convey to as many young people as possible the excitement that we feel in stem cell research. And it'll be a real challenge for Doug Melton and me to uh, meet the same sort of standards that we've seen in some of the previous uh, lecture series. But we're lucky because we have a really exciting uh, subject to work with. Stem cells are something that everybody's heard about. And what we're hoping to be able to do with this series is to make it crystal clear exactly what stem cells are what they can and can't do, and why scientists are so excited about working on them. Buongiorno, ragazzi. Don't worry, I'm not going to go on in Italian, but it's really wonderful to be here, and specifically to be here with all of you. I have to say that it was just about when I was your age, when I was 15, that I first became obsessed with biology. I had a fantastic teacher in high school, 
and I was thinking I was going to be an artist, and I got this, uh, this, this course that just made me realize that this was absolutely what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I think that the excitement of biology is very infectious, and I hope that some of you will get it and catch it at this, at this event. I'm also very excited to be able to do this with Doug, who for many years has shared with me this insatiable curiosity for developing embryos. But today I'm going to talk specifically about my most favorite topic of this particular part of my life, which is regeneration. So from Doug, you heard that the embryonic stem cell, the ultimate embryonic stem cell, which is a fertilized egg, can give rise to a number of different tissues, in fact, to all of the tissues in your body. And it does so with a gradual process of differentiation and specification into these tissues that you see rendered here. But what Doug touched on, and what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking to you about, is the fact that we must keep the deep and uh, very complex formation of our body intact for the entire time we're alive. We have to keep our skin intact, we have to keep our bones intact, and even uh, such very highly turning over tissues uh, as some of the tissues that Doug mentioned have to stay the same shape, the size, and the function has to remain as well. So we're going to be talking about replenishment and renewal, which actually is happening even in you as young people. It's happening as soon as you form your body. And so it's a very interesting and engaging part of science. Now, I'll just point out a few of the organs that we know are very good at replenishing themselves. And Doug mentioned these. In the intestine, we are continuously sloughing off cells inside of our intestinal wall in response to the food that passes through, and that has to be continuously renewed. Or the liver. The liver clears our, our system, our circulation of toxins and waste products, and therefore has a heavy duty job. The liver cells turn over and new ones are replacing all the time. And finally, our skin, which of course is our barrier to the outside world, is something that is getting sloughed off all the time and has to be replaced and replaced and replaced. And for those tissues, there are specialized cells that are set aside to do this very job. So are those um, daily replenishing and renewing um, kinds of processes regeneration? What is regeneration? We hear a lot about regeneration. In fact, most of the beauty products that make your skin look better um, are apparently touted as great regeneration agents. So I'd like to actually get down to the real meaning of regeneration as we as biologists consider it. And to do so, I'm going to use a myth, the myth of Prometheus. So the ancients were very much aware of regeneration in that's clear from this myth that came out of the ancient world in which Prometheus, who is this giant titan, uh, stole fire from the gods, and fire stood for art and civilization, and he gave it to humans. And Jupiter was enraged by this theft, and so he took Prometheus and put him up against the Mount Caucasus rock, and tied him there, chained him there, and then sent a vulture every day to tear out his liver and devour it. And every night when the vulture departed, Prometheus would lie there in agony, but his liver would regenerate, so that in the morning, the vulture had breakfast. And this went on and on. And of course, we, as mere mortals, aren't quite as good at doing that trick of regenerating our livers every night, although some of us probably wish we could. Um, and I should also say that if the vulture had chosen another organ to devour, such as Prometheus's heart, he wouldn't have been around to tell the tale. But the idea here is that regeneration is the reactivation of developmental processes, such as those that gave rise to your liver in the first place, to restore the missing and damaged tissues. Now, is that the same as wound healing? It's not exactly the same. So let's look at two different tissues in the adult, both of which can get injured. The liver on the right, which is healthy at this point, and a healthy muscle. Let's imagine that both of these are injured by a crush to your muscle or by some sort of damage to your liver. Now, in response to injury, the first thing your body does, of course, is to close the wound as fast as possible to avoid loss of blood and to start to launch a response against any infection, which usually creates a fibrotic scar. And in fact, that's exactly what happens if healing 
is allowed to proceed, and it's an absolutely essential way in which we take care of less gruesome injuries than the promethean vultures um, and devouring of the liver. Now, the difference between wound healing and regeneration is beautifully illustrated by these two tissues because a muscle, although you'll see, has some regenerative capacity, can't really regrow. And anyone who's been in a serious car accident knows that the muscle is the hardest thing to actually get back. Whereas the liver can fully regenerate. It attains its form and function just as if it was new. So what is going on here? Are stem cells involved? What's the difference between wound healing and regeneration? I'd like to take a minute to just recapitulate some of the points that Doug made in his lecture about stem cells. On the left here, you see cells that are dividing. The blue cell knows to make two daughter cells that are blue. The green makes two daughter cells that are green. This is the way the majority of the cells in your body actually divide to replenish your body. Now, a stem cell is slightly different. A stem cell can do exactly the same thing. It can divide to make two stem cells. But the thing that makes it truly a stem cell is what you'll see on the right. Here, the cell is giving rise to two daughters, one of which will maintain a stem cell um, nature, and the other of which will be, go on to make either a blue, a green, or a yellow cell. So this is the difference between the division of a regular cell that can only make itself and a stem cell that can make itself but can make other things as well. And in the embryo, of course, the stem cells hold sway at the very early stages that you saw Doug talking about with those eight cells sitting as an early embryo. But soon, all sorts of specification has to occur, as we saw. We have to be able to make livers and, and pancreases and skin. And all of those other colors, then, are represented here in the embryo. And the stem cells get diluted up and become less and less until in the adult. There are actually very, very few stem cells in our body. You heard about the most prevalent ones, but even in the blood, only about one in 10,000 cells in your bone marrow is actually a stem cell. So stem cells in the adult are there, but they're much, much less prevalent. Now that's true for us, but it's not necessarily the case for organisms that rely on being able to regenerate, truly regenerate in order to survive. And we're going to have a little look at some of these because I'm a biologist and I love animals. And we're going to see how simple animals, such as the planaria that you see on the left, on the top, the hydra, which is the green thing that looks like a sprig, and the famous starfish, are capable of regenerating. They regenerate in the most miraculous fashion. You can cut these things in half, and literally both halves will make a new organism, and I'll show you a bit about that. The complex animals you see below also are very good at regenerating, but they do it with a little less uh, drama in that they can regenerate a limb or a tail, but they can't regenerate an entire animal from just um, a single chunk. So let's look at planaria. Some of you in the audience have actually done experiments with this as pre preparation for this talk. And so this will be old hat to you, but a planaria that's cut in half can actually regenerate the part that's missing. That means that the whole head of the planaria can regenerate and the whole tail can regenerate. And this is because planaria are actually full of stem cells. They have little cells called neoblasts in planaria speak, which are capable of regenerating large portions or whole planaria. And so that's the reason why the limit of regeneration in a planaria is so uh, extraordinarily dramatic. Cutting a planaria into many little pieces gives you a planaria for each piece. And that's because each piece contains some of those stem cells. So some of the students did an experiment with planaria, helped by uh, Alejandro Alvarez, who's an expert on this. And the question they had was, in a planaria, shown here with the head on the left, stained up blue, and um, the tail on the right, if one cuts the planaria in two at either position one, two, or three, leaving an almost whole planaria minus a head, a half a planaria, or just a tail, what happens at the, uh, at, at the uh, regeneration point? Basically, what happens is you get a new head in each case. And you can see this by looking for the eye spots. Those cute little eye spots are actually photosensitive. Now, the question was, is a planaria's capability for making a head different if it's here or if you have to start here? And so the ability to do this was tested by looking at the time it took 
to put that head back into place. And as you can see, the best, the winner of this game was the largest piece, which had a very short time bef before the head was formed, whereas the loser was the tail. It took a bit longer, but even so, we got a tail growing a head. And here are just some beautiful shots of the student's work in which you see the stem cells, those neoblasts, those sparkly cells, shown up on the right as a stain for the stem cells and on the left in the context of the whole animal. Now, it just so happens the one on the left had its tail cut off and the one on the right had its head cut off. And that's why those cells seem to be so active at this point. Okay, so now um, that's one kind of very dramatic uh, regeneration, but we, it's hard to relate to a planaria. I mean, it's got cute little eyes, but for the rest of it, it doesn't have much else that looks like us. However, I'm going to show you an organism, if I can put this glove on straight, that looks a lot more like us than that planaria, although you may not think so. For a biologist, this guy is one short step away from mankind. And I'm going to bring him out here and see if I can get him on the close TV. There he is. This is a salamander or a newt. I'm going to put him here out so that you can see him, I hope, on the screen. He's really quiet at the moment, but these guys can scamper like crazy. And they're very, very small and very easy to lose, but <laughs> they have, as I hope you can see, a head. You see he's moving it now. They have two forelimbs, two hind limbs. They even have fingers. I think these guys have five or four and a tail. And inside they have a beating heart, lungs, a liver, a pancreas, intestines, a skin, and a very small brain. And they're very, very capable of uh, running and outrunning their prey. But if by any chance part of their tail or their limb gets cut off, they can regenerate the entire thing. So you see, I'm just going to see if I can make him move a little bit so that you can see those limbs. You see how detailed they are? Now, Doug was entranced at the rehearsal and asked me to get this little guy, and this didn't happen in the rehearsal, to get this little guy and show you what his belly looks like, because his belly is beautiful and red. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> now I'm going to do another trick, which is, he's so cute, I'm going to kiss him and turn him into a prince. That was for you, Doug. Okay, guy, that's enough for you. Back in the story. Now, he's lucky. He didn't get his leg cut off. He just got a kiss. But what I'm going to show you is what happens if you do cut off the leg of a newt. And for that, we have a beautiful video. So let's start the video. Now, we're going to have a look at the way in which a, um, a, an amputated limb grows over the course of about 90 days in a salamander. That's a time-lapse movie, watching that thing grow. And now I'm going to see what's really going on. Here's the salamander, and it's got a completely new limb. It looks perfect. It has inside bone. It has nerves and muscle, and it can even wiggle. In fact, it's perfect. Now we're going to cut it off. <laughs> Here's the good news, it grows back. So don't be too scared. First, wound healing. Did you see that wound heal? Now we're watching what this newt can do that we cannot do. Cells are streaming out of the surrounding tissues into the area of the wound and forming what we call a blastema, which is a group of undifferentiated cells that are in fact really just like stem cells. And they're multicolored because they come from skin, from muscle, and even from cartilage. And these have a miraculous memory of what they used to be and are able to form a perfectly functional limb. And that happens all within anywhere from 30 to 90 days, depending on the size. Those little guys would do it faster. So we'd like to know more about how that works. Um, one thing that I should say is that unlike the planaria, the limb that's cut off cannot make a new newt. And you might want to know why that is. Because in theory, you could ask, well, maybe you can just clone the nose, as Woody Allen would say. But we can't, and here's why. Let's have a closer look at what's going on when that regeneration blastema 
or group of cells at the tip starts to really do its trick. So there's the amputation plane of a really uh, uh, early stage in which all those cells have moved up. And inside that blastema are cells that are differentiating, that come from a number of different sources within the stump, an epithelium that closes over, dedifferentiated cells that are probably stem cells, and extracellular matrix that holds the whole thing together. Those are the players. Now what we know from some beautiful experiments that were done by Jeremy Brox and Ellie Tanaka is that you can label cells from the unamputated limb that are, in fact, muscle stem cells, and I'm going to tell you a bit more about those in a minute. And those can actually go in, it can be re-injected into this amputated stump, and then they will actually begin to form part of the um, regenerating limb. And if we label those, we can see what they become. And what you're seeing here is that muscle stem cells became cartilage, and in another picture, you see here that muscle stem cells became skin. So this tells you that there is some potency within the regenerating limb that allows cells to make decisions about being things that they normally weren't going to do if this traumatic event hadn't happened. And this kind of plasticity is something that is extremely um, interesting to biologists because it's the key to understanding how it is that stem cells in the adult are capable of recapitulating some of that marvelous um, potency that we found in the embryo. So I'm going to leave you then before questions with this question of why we can't regenerate missing body parts. Is it because we're missing certain kinds of signals? Is it because there aren't enough stem cells? What are the reasons? And what we'll hopefully do after questions is then to explore some of the mechanisms that we have discovered in this fast-moving field to solve some of these mysteries. So, let's take some questions. Yeah. Why is the mute not able to regenerate, like the arm to regenerate completely? I, I'm sorry if I didn't make it clear. The question was, why isn't the arm capable of regenerating the whole mute? Well, there are a couple of, in, of answers to that. Number one, as you'll see, an arm, as you can imagine, is a very complicated structure. Planaria are extraordinary, but they're not as complicated. The second point is that because of our complicated structure, we need nerves and blood vessels and other kinds of cells that float around our body to maintain life. And so, basically, it's impossible to keep that little newt limb alive long enough for it to grow back anything. But there's another reason. We think that the information that you need to grow back a limb isn't actually in the limb. And we'll get to that in the next session. Now, let's see how good I'm at this. I'm really, hand-eye coordination is not my specialty. Yes? Could we take a newt's stem cells and implant them in a human's body, or would that, like with the DNA, not match her? <laughs> well, um, we could do that. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it <laughs> uh, for all sorts of reasons, one of which is that uh, we are trained as highly evolved immunocompetent organisms to reject things like new cells unless we're in the process of eating them, which we're not gonna do either. So I think to get to your question in a little more detail, the issue of whether a stem cell from one species can function in the context of another species is something that we're going to hear about a little more from Doug tomorrow. But suffice it to say that there are experiments that have been done in the culture dish where newt cells and mouse cells have been put together. And the question is, does the newt teach the mouse cell how to do some of the tricks it can do? Or does the mouse cell tell the newt cell, forget it, brother, <laughs> I'm the boss here? And the answer is, the new cell wins. So that's the exciting and encouraging thing. Yes. Sorry, I can't even throw. When people have surgeries to lengthen limbs, like when they separate the bones and then the bones grow back into them, why can't they just like put stem cells there to make and when that happens, is there more muscle? Like how does that like why if there's an absence of stem cells there, then how is it growing? 
How, sorry, which part are you, which part is growing? I didn't quite catch that. When they separate the bones and then the bones grow back to you. Ah. Well, interestingly enough, bones are some of the most regenerative structures in our body. And they actually grow back better than muscle. So for instance, if you crush your leg in an accident and the bone is broken, your doctor will say, no problem about growing your bone back, that will heal and it will actually form the bone as it was before, due to all sorts of signals that the bone somehow senses, much like the new. The muscle just isn't as regenerative and we don't understand what it is about different tissues that make it one more regenerative and another less, but we suspect that it may have something to do with stem cells. And that's the big excitement about stem cells, that if you could understand how stem cells in one part of your body can do such a great job, and, and your other uh, organs don't seem to be able to do such a good job, could you use stem cells from one part of your body to cure the other? And I'm gonna be talking about that after the break. I wanna get someone at the back because I wanna show that I can throw, as well as Doug. <laughs> There, that's better. <laughs> oh my god, I don't know. Somebody back there. The guy in black. Um, can newts like regenerate um, organ systems or is it just arms? Newts can regenerate organ systems. Newts can regenerate um, an extraordinary number of different parts. And in fact, what we'll see tomorrow is another example of a highly regenerative organism, the fish which can regenerate its fins, its tail, and its heart, as can the newt. Not the entire heart, but a large chunk. The newt can regenerate its lower jaw if you cut that off. It gets gruesome after that, but it's an amazing little organism. Oh, okay, let's take, take one from over there, the fellow with the blue shirt. Um, in the example of the newt, would there be a specific um, resource uh, limit as to how many limbs that a new could regenerate according to its resources? Um, what's extraordinary about the newt is that, sadistic as it may seem, you can cut a regenerated limb off as many times as you can stomach the process, and it will grow back every time exactly the same way. So it appears that the newt has the whole process well sussed out and can do it exactly the same way. It's a very robust program, if that's what you meant. So it appears that there isn't some sort of a stem cell pool or some kind of a molecule that runs out after the first regenerative event. Now I've got to do some more embarrassing throws to get one over here. <laughs> yep, that's terrible. And this one, I'm going to do relay because it's too embarrassing. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go for the lady in light blue. Like what triggers the stem cells to go to like a wound to form the last That's a very good question. And we believe that there are a series of acute uh, signals that occur immediately after the wound has been, uh, has been created uh, that tell the organism that there's been a traumatic event, much like a wound healing response. But that second uh, event in which instead of just closing the wound and remaining a stump like an amputee that would happen if my arm was cut off, there seems to be another set of signals that we would dearly love to know about. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of them in the second half of my talk. Now I'm afraid that's it for questions. All right. Let's go on. So. The question is why we can't grow back a limb. Obviously, there are many questions in the audience that pertain to this, and anticipating those questions, I thought I would just put up a picture of what actually is inside your limb. And this is a simplified artistic version of it, but as you can see, it's a very complex structure. And therefore, when we consider the way in which the salamander grows back its limb, we really need to think in terms of how these various complex structures know to become what they are. And one possible reason why we can't do this trick is because of the risk of cancer. And I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, but two others are that we've lost programs that help us to regenerate our bodies, or that we simply don't have enough stem cells such as the planaria, who's full of them. <laughs>
So let's look at the one about cancer. Now, why do I bring this up? Any cell that can launch a proliferative response the way the explosive divisions that you see early on in embryogenesis take place have the capacity to go wrong because cancer is cell division gone horribly wrong. And so when we think about that extraordinary growth of the little salamander's limb, we have to realize that that is putting the salamander, in theory, in risk of getting cancer. And why is that? Differentiation, as you heard from Doug, in involves taking a cell that is uncommitted and very potent to become many different things and assigning functions to its daughter cells. But during that regenerative, the regenerative event that we saw in the newt, another event occurs, which I'd like to just mention here. And that is that thing one that we heard about from Doug in the pancreas, a differentiating cell actually dividing. But in this case, the division is such that a backward step is taken so that now the cell is in fact potent again and can become more than one thing. And that's why we could see those muscle stem cells becoming cartilage or epidermis in the limb because dedifferentiation can occur. Now, in a tumor, that's exactly what happens. A normal cell divides and grows in a way that is consistent with its environment until a mutation somehow takes out some essential break on proliferation. And then the cell proliferates in a way that is inconsistent with its position, and it essentially grows out of control, and that's a tumor. So in theory, a cell that's dedifferentiated is a cell that could be a cancer cell. So what's the difference? Why don't newts get cancer? Let's just look at dedifferentiation, and specifically in the case of muscle, because I mentioned the fact that muscle can dedifferentiate in the case of the newt's amputated limb. Here's a close-up of what muscle cells look like after you've cut the limb off at the stump. Very soon afterwards, these muscle cells, which are rather specialized in the sense that they have multinuclei inside a single cytoplasm that's full of contractile proteins for their capacity to contract, these different nuclei sever themselves off, compartmentalize themselves, take a few organelles, put a, a, a membrane around them, and run off to become new stem cells. This is a, a rather dramatic thing, and we don't know what the signal is to do that, but that would be a very interesting answer to one of our students' questions. And that's perhaps why it is that the blastema can then form so rapidly because there's lots of muscle at that cut wound, and all of it can start to produce these potent little progenitor cells. These cells can come from bone, they can come from muscle, and in general, they regrow the limb structure very, very rapidly. So there must be something about the limb which is different from the rest of the pr proliferative processes that we find in our bodies that go awry. And so to understand the difference between dedifferentiation in these kinds of animals and the uncontrolled dedifferentiation that we have is one of the great goals of regenerative biology. So the answer is, the risk doesn't seem to be there in these animals, would it be in us? Now another possibility is that we have the loss or alteration of a genetic program. Well, that's sort of obvious. Something's lost, otherwise we could do it. And in fact, we know that there's an inverse relationship between evolutionary uh, scale, here shown with the bodybuilder as the epitome of evolution, and uh, <laughs> the lowly planaria, uh, who probably doesn't like being at the bottom, um, but can do a much better job of re reproducing itself. So somewhere along the line, we've lost some programs. We can grow muscle, that's for sure. We can look like that woman, or at least some of you probably can. But what we can't do is amputate her arm and grow it back. So some kind of a program is missing. And so scientists have asked, what are the potential signals that could be present in the new limb that are absent in our more developed and larger bodies. 
And a clue from this came from a beautiful experiment that Jeremy Brox did several years ago, in which he asked a question, if I cut the new limb off below the elbow, near the wrist, what grows? And the answer is, a little blastema forms, as you see, and over the 70 days that it takes to regrow that limb, it grows exactly what it needs to, basically just the lower part of the forearm, the wrist, and the hand. Then Jeremy cut off the limb at, above the elbow position and asked what happens. And in the same period of time, the blastema knew to grow an elbow, a forearm, a wrist, and a limb, and a hand, rather. So something in that stump knew where it was, and at the time that it was amputated, immediately launched a new program that would be different if the amputation happened here or if it happened here. So one possible way of thinking about this is that there's something that's different in its concentration at the top of your arm and at the bottom of your arm, and that that gives you some kind of a zip code to know where you are along your arm, even in an adult like the new. And in fact, recently, the same group has come upon a cell surface molecule, which has this really sexy name, CD59. And CD59 turns out to be at very high levels on the surface of cells of the limb proximal to the body, and at much lower levels on cells in the limb down at the wrist. And so the question they ask is, could CD59 give cells an address? Or is it just a correlation? And to answer that question, they did some very ele elegant experiments. They tried to change a cell's address by giving a cell more CD59 than it should see. So in this case, what they did on the top is a control in which they took a cell out of the limb before it was amputated and labeled it with a red dot and then replaced it into the growing blastema of an amputated limb and asked where do the progeny of that cell end up? So all the cells have the mark and the progeny have the mark. And as you see, the cell ends up at the right place in the wrist because that's where it came from. Now we do the same experiment, except this time we engineer that cell to express a lot of this cell surface protein CD59. And then we put the cell back into the same position on the blastoma. And as you can see in the lower panel, that cell thinks that it should be down here somewhere because of the higher levels of CD59 that it's expressed. So it's probably cordoned off and the guy says, hey, you, you should be down at that end. The problem is that it's not a benign arrangement because, in fact, the whole experiment results in a deformation of the limb. So that not only does this tell the cell where to go, and it's a different place, but once it's there, it produces some sort of deformity. And in fact, what we see is that on the control on the left, there are a number of different concentrations of CD59 shown on the bottom in a schematic way with different colors, and those color uh, orders are dis in disarray and are um, disrupted by the presence of cells expressing too much CD59. So there's no more green cells because the cells that are there are expressing CD59 at a level that should be red. So in theory, what you could say then is that we obviously have lost the CD59 zip code and therefore we simply don't have the right programs to do the job and we'll never be able to regenerate because we wouldn't be able to know how to grow that new limb. So a question then is, are, are humans and mammals just incapable of regeneration because we can't afford it because of cancer or because we don't have the right programs? Well, the answer is no. And improbable as it may seem, this is the only case of true regeneration in the mammalian kingdom. Now, for those of you who've never seen one of these before, it's a deer with antlers. And for those of you who know nothing about deer with antlers, this is very seasonal, it turns out that every year, these antlers fall off, every single year. And every year they're replaced, new antlers grow. And every time the new antler grows, it acquires a new point. And so eventually, we talk about six point bucks. These are deers that have had six years to develop these different points. Think what that means. 
at the base of the skull of the deer, right where my finger is, right there, is an area on the skull of the deer, which is different from our skull, called um, a pedicle. And on that pedicle are a series of little tissues that are in a little ring that are full of stem cells. And at appropriate moment, when the deer antler has fallen off, those stem cells then get into action and grow an entire new antler that's perfect every time. And not only that, it has a different pattern according to how old the, uh, ant uh, the deer is. And finally, it does it at an enormous speed. So when this guy is going full tilt for growing an antler, because this has to happen every season, because he uses these for display to get girls, this area right here has to be pumping out new um, growth at two centimeters a day. And the growth is all from the tip. So it looks just like a blastema. Okay, now, that being said, uh, it doesn't obviously lend itself particularly to any kind of medical um, applications. And I'd like to finish off today by talking about a slightly more serious subject. And that is the possibility that we have smaller numbers of stem cells, and that's why we can't keep up with trauma and serious injury. Now, you heard from Doug that, in fact, the bone marrow is a very rich source of stem cells that turn over very, very rapidly, although they are proportionally in very small numbers. And so the possibility might be that these bone marrow cells could zoom around on a highway in our bodies and fix things as they found problems. And this was a very popular idea, um, and has actually given rise to a number of very exciting clinical trials in which bone marrow cells are being used to try to cure various diseases. But I'd like to talk about another source of stem cells, namely cells that are resident within a particular tissue and don't circulate on the stem cell highway. And in this case, I'll talk about muscle because I know a little bit about it. And in muscle, as I said, Fibers contain many nuclei, but they also contain within them rare little cells, stem cells, called satellite cells, which I've mentioned before, that are capable of responding to injury by proliferating. So they have, in some ways, a sort of a stem cell like nature. The problem is that there aren't that many of them. And in fact, in a devastating disease like muscular dystrophy, where the muscle is weakened by a genetic lesion, robbing it of an essential protein, and causing it to be fragile. Every time it's used, it actually breaks and has to be replaced. The stem cells can keep up with this for a while, but eventually, there just aren't enough. And so, at that point, what happens is that the muscle loses its capacity to contract. The injuries, instead of being replenished, actually act like a wound heal and turn into scar and fibrotic tissue, and the muscle becomes actually quite paralyzed so an obvious way to think about this would be to replenish their waning cells in their muscles with some kind of a stem cell that could at least help with the, um, co the consequences of this disease, if not the cause. So in my lab, I've been working on just such a question with my colleague Antonio Musaro at the University of Rome. So together, we wanted to de develop a question of um, just such a nature. Could we take a bone marrow cell and make it contribute in some way to muscle that was injured? So to do this experiment, we had to set it up. And because we work with mice, we can engineer mice to express all sorts of wonderful uh, proteins. And in this case, we used a mouse that we had in the lab in which the same alkaline phosphatase gene you heard about from Doug as a marker was driven by a regulatory element that activates it only in those skeletal muscle fibers. So if you look inside this mouse, as you see on the right, the muscle fibers are, for the most part, a sort of a dark purpley blue when we stain them. And that means they're expressing this gene, which we call HAP. So if we see HAP, it means the cell is a muscle cell. Now what we do is we remove bone marrow from this mouse. Now because the mouse is transgenic, for that marker. That means it's genetically engineered so that all of its cells have that marker. 
The bone marrow cells actually contain this marker, but it's silent. Why? Because it's not a muscle cell at the moment, it's a bone marrow cell. And so it doesn't recognize the signals to turn on the hap gene. So the question is, will these bone marrow cells ever turn purple if we put them into the right context? Now, what's the right context? In this case, we're going to use a mouse model of muscular dystrophy called the NDX mouse. This mouse is actually um, a very well-studied mouse. It undergoes some of the same problems as the boys. Mice escape the real devastating effects of muscular dystrophy, but their muscle looks awful. It looks just like that picture of that little boy's muscle, constantly regenerating, constantly degenerating. And so we asked the question, could we improve the muscle of the mouse functionally, and could we stave off the devastating effects of the disease? So we did the experiment. We introduced into a vein in the mouse's leg some of these bone marrow cells from our hap mouse and asked, do we ever see any cells that engraft into the muscle and turn purple? Because if we see them turning purple, we know they come from the hap mouse, they come from bone marrow, and they're becoming muscle. And every once in a while, we saw one of these. About 1% to 2% of the skeletal muscles in the mouse actually turned purple. Unfortunately, 1% to 2% isn't going to cure a muscular dystrophic boy, so we had to think of other ways in which we could augment this rare but very exciting result, and we did so using a growth factor. Now, in this case, we used a growth factor called insulin-like growth factor 1, and like the growth factors you heard about from Doug, it's a growth factor that actually promotes growth, but it promotes a number of other things as well. It's important for growth in the fetus, it's not so important for growth in our bodies. It promotes all sorts of different kinds of cell uh, functions, and then eventually it is very uh, interestingly induced in response to injury locally. So if you injure muscle or you injure any part of your body, IGF-1 is transiently expressed. Now, what does it do? It's a growth factor, it's a molecule, and it circulates around the cell milieu looking for a receptor to bind to. Once it binds to the surface of the cell, it sends a cell signal, an intracellular signal, that eventually ends up in a transcriptional event, which turns on a whole set of genes. And we can study those genes in the same way that Doug explained to you with chips. But for today's lecture, we'll let just talk about the way in which IGF-1 works at the level of the body. Locally, it's expressed, as I said, in response to injury and in muscle and in heart, it tends to induce growth, and it's also expressed by the liver, and in this case, it circulates throughout the body. But we can get away without the stuff that's circulating in the body, and in fact, we find that the circulating form of IGF-1 has none of the same properties as the form that's made in the muscle itself. So we had the chance then to make a mouse that was expressing more than its normal share of IGF-1 in the skeletal muscle, and we did that with transgenesis, and it's the same way we made the hap mouse, and we do it by taking a fertilized egg out of a mouse and injecting it physically with DNA, encoding our IGF-1 protein, the gene of IGF-1 goes in there, in this case driven with a muscle-specific regulatory element. That embryo is transferred into a foster mother, and that foster mother gives rise to pups, some of which hopefully got the gene, and if so, those pups then can be used to study the effects of IGF-1 in the muscle. And what we found was when we mated those IGF-1 animals to the MDX mouse and did the same experiment, we got a very exciting result, which you can see on the right. The one on the left is the same story I told you before, and the one on the right is what happens when we inject bone marrow cells marked with HAP into an MDX mouse that's also expressing this growth factor in the muscle at which point 15 to 20% of the cells are blue or purple instead of 1 to 2%. So we're seeing a remarkable increase in the capacity for these cells to actually to get up, taken up and become muscle. So the moral of the story then is that salamanders, if we go back to our initial survey of regenerative processes in the animal kingdom, can actually use local cells to replace damaged tissue. So if you cut off the end of a salamander's limb, you can regenerate it. With mammals, we're basically 
looking at a slightly less efficient arrangement whereby circulating cells can have some effect along with local cells. But to really make that a clinically relevant uh, phenomenon, we're definitely going to have to resort to some tricks. And in this case, we used a genetic trick in which we used growth factors. So then in conclusion, tomorrow I'll be able to tell you a bit more about the mechanisms that we envision to identify the factors that we'll need in order to augment the extraordinary capacity of stem cells to do a better job for us in our own bodies. And I'll stop there and take questions. Um, you talked earlier about how the liver is able to regenerate and like heal itself. Um, and then there's also the case of liver cancer. Is it possible to inject stem cells from like a healthy donor into livers and then like kind of reverse the effects of liver cancer? Well, it's a great idea. And in fact, liver transplants are, have been very successful precisely because of the fact that a diseased liver can be liberally completely replaced with a small portion of a healthy one and it grows right back to the full-sized liver in the recipient. The problem with liver cancer is that cancer itself is a very nasty disease because it grows even from a single cell. And so it's unlikely that you'd want to leave any cancer in the body. You'd want to try to remove it before you try to regrow the, the liver. But the concept of regeneration of the liver is one that's been well used and, and is, is an extremely successful operation for many people who have damaged liver. Yeah. Hi, I'm this one I can do. Uh, Look at that. Practice. And, uh, she's talking about regenerating the liver. And um, if we have you know, some cells in our bone marrow, those bone marrow cells, then how come as we age, you know, we get shorter? Why do we age if we're able to regenerate ourselves? Why do we age if we're able to regenerate ourselves? It's a great question, and if you promise to come tomorrow, I'll answer it for you. I have a whole talk on aging, and it will take me too long to do it now. But you get a t-shirt because you're close, and I feel like I can probably pull it off. Okay, notice I can't just take you in the front because it's not fair. Okay, I'll go for the fellow in black who thought I was going to ask him a question at the very end. Um, I was just curious, how far can you cut, uh, how far up the limb of a newt can you cut and it will still regenerate? Can you cut all the way? I mean, it's, I guess I'm a bad example, but if you cut up above the shoulder, would it still regenerate, or how far? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. I'm, I have never cut the arm off a newt, but I presume that you can get pretty much as close to the trunk as you can get a scissors, and it still will regenerate. If, um, if you would then go in with a hammer and chisel and take out its whole shoulder bone, I suspect that we might get something a little less nice than a full limb. Um, but I think your question is very good. How much information do you need to start with to regenerate an entire limb? And I think that the issue is very, very pertinent because obviously there must be something that tells the organism that I am a shoulder and then I am a limb. But I don't think that there's any boundary line there. It's probably just more of a practical issue of how you could actually cut that limb off. So you can get pretty close to the bone, as it were, and still regenerate. Um, the lady in white. If you cut off the arm of a uterus helmet or whatever, Will it grow back the same exact arm? Like, if it had a mark on it, will it grow back with the same marking and everything? That's a wonderful question. The answer is that you do lose some of the uh, actual um, markation on the limb. And we believe that's because some of the cells that end up in the limb to make this demarcation originate from someplace other than the limb. And so, in fact, you may not get the exact pattern back. Um, the lady, you know what, I'm forgetting about the t-shirts, but this is really tough. Can I do relays? Because otherwise it's not going to work. I'll throw it halfway there. And now, for you, whee! <laughs> uh, at our feet. Okay, uh, the lady in pink. Uh, 
Um, I was wondering if you were to take a mute and cut off two limbs at the exact same time, once at the wrist and then one maybe at the elbow, would it focus on the more serious injury or would it regrow the same two at the time? Or would it maybe the CD59, would it get the mix up, which one was cut at the wrist and which one at the elbow? It's a great question. Um, the answer is that these events are local and so the limb that needed to grow back just a hand would grow back the hand. The limb that needed to grow back the whole thing would grow back the whole thing. It appears that these are local signals, and therefore they don't actually get mixed up across the body. It's a very, the, the CD59 molecule is actually sitting on the surface of the cells within the limb. So it's as if the surface of the cells were just a more intense pink up here, and less intense down here. So it's an intrinsic capacity to read your zip code from your local information, rather than some guy coming around and telling you. And, I'm sorry, got to get rid of the t-shirt. Um, I'm getting better at this, but I'm afraid we've got to stop. Time is up. And thank you all for your attention, and we'll see you in the morning. Thank you, Nadia, and uh, there were plenty of questions left, and obviously the people out there uh, watching this on the DVD in the future or on the web right now can't ask questions right here, but we have a mechanism to answer questions without fear of flying t-shirts, and, and that's found on our that website, biowinteractive.org, a feature called Ask a Scientist, and that's worth looking at. If you have a question on this or other topics, you can send it into that site, our volunteer scientists will answer it, uh, will answer you directly, and if it's a, a, a question that we feel is worthwhile, we'll even post the question and answer, and those are archived, so it's a very interesting resource for other, other questions in any case. So thank you. Medical Institute. The 2006 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Potent Biology, Stem Cells, Cloning, and Regeneration, will be given by Dr. Douglas Melton, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Harvard University, and Dr. Nadia Rosenthal, Senior Scientist at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. The fourth lecture is titled, Stem Cells and the End of Aging. And now to introduce our program, the President of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Cech. Welcome to the final presentation in this year's Holiday Lecture Series on Stem Cells. You may have noticed a common thread running through these lectures. The tools and findings of basic research provide a powerful springboard for medical advancement. 
Doug Melton's love of developmental biology is leading to better understanding and hopefully new treatments of diabetes. Nadia Rosenthal's commitment to understanding muscle is leading her towards breakthroughs in preventing and treating heart attacks. And discoveries made in mice are being used to translate to strategies for human therapy much more quickly than ever before. In this talk, Nadia will extend our thinking about stem cells and regeneration to include how stem cells may play a role in reversing the project pro process of aging and perhaps even extending lifespan. And now a brief video to introduce Nadia. As a child, I really was just a naturalist, and so we spent a lot of time just foraging around and essentially looking into rock pools and having a good time. But I didn't think of myself as a scientist at the time. In fact, my parents are from the theater, so if anything, I was considered a budding artist because I liked to draw. And I think my parents were quite astounded that I might take on something as bizarre for them as a biology career. So in this case, it would be opposite. Why don't you become a sculptor? Why don't you become an artist? And instead I said, no, I want to be a biologist. No, no, <laughs> let's see, what are we? There's something exciting and almost obsessive about being a scientist. There's never an end to the questions you can ask. And I see absolutely no distinction in my students between that bug being caught by men or women. It's absolutely equal. And I am convinced that this is merely a question of teaching women how to be competitive and how to ask for what they need to get their science done. What's really great about having stuck it out this long in science with that initial uh, passion still intact is that our lab is actually now able to answer some limited questions about how organisms form. And I'm absolutely secure that the next generation of scientists, the young students and postdocs in my lab, are going to be the ones who will really be able to unravel that in a way that will satisfy what I was looking for, namely a quantitative, way to approach the uh, somehow intangible nature of beauty and pattern and form. And I think that this is probably going to be the reason that I want to work on aging research, because I want to stick around long enough to see that happen. Well, buongiorno again. Today we're going to follow some of the themes that we started hearing about in Doug's lecture about degenerative diseases that often affect the aged, and how these diseases are, in some cases, uh, diseases that we could model or perhaps even treat with stem cells. Today I'm going to focus on not the diseases that are associated with aging, but the actual aging process itself. So we're all getting old, that's the bad news. Um, and what's worse, if you look on the left at some of the attributes of youth, robust organs, high tissue turnover, wounds healing very rapidly with less inflammation associated with that healing and less scarring. All of those youthful attributes are somehow blunted and compromised as we get older. So on the right, the old gentleman, this wonderful drawing of Leonardo da Vinci showing youth and age facing each other the older man is uh, compromised, frailer organs, lower tissue turnover, wounds healing more slowly. And when they are wounded, older people tend to heal less well so that inflammation sets in and scarring can often compromise the function of the tissues and organs. So the question is, how much can stem cells actually address these natural but rather alarming side effects of getting older. Let's have a look at how stem cells might contribute to different tissue types because different tissue types actually age at different rates. So if we consider tissues in different categories according to their capacity to turn over at the top, high cell turnover, 
high regenerative potential. They include blood cells. We've heard a lot about those, gut epithelium and the epidermis. And that's because, we believe, there are abundant stem cells associated with those tissues. Now, in the medium category, we see such tissues as liver, which can actually regenerate quite well, and skeletal muscle, less so. But it's better than some of the lower regenerating tissues, such as the brain, the kidney, or the heart, about which we'll hear about later. And in each case, the capacity for regeneration appears to at least roughly track with the contribution of stem cells. So how could it be that stem cells have an effect on aging? Maybe they're just tracking with aging. Is it possible that they actually cause it? If so, there are a few different ways in which we could imagine this could occur. One would be that we simply have less stem cells as we get older. Or perhaps we have the same number, but they're less good at doing what they normally do. Or perhaps the environment in which they find themselves in our aging bodies has shifted so that they're all right, but where they are is not. So let's look at each of these possibilities and see whether there's any truth to them. The first question is whether there are less stem cells as we grow older. And to look at this question, we're going to look at a particular tissue type, which I particularly like to work on, skeletal muscle, which is sort of in the middle of the road. There are stem cells, those tissue cells we talked about yesterday, the satellite cells. But the question is, are there the same number of satellite cells as the muscle ages? Now, I'd have to say one thing about muscle. You all know that we can change the size of our muscle rather voluntarily by going to the gym or by working out in other ways. And in fact, muscle is one of the most marvelously responsive tissues in that sense. And yet at the same time, as we grow older, no matter how much we work out, no matter how much that master athlete runs, we end up losing up to a third of the muscle mass in our bodies by the time we're 75 or 80 years old. And that really leads to a lot of problems in society. Older people are frailer, they tend to fall, and then their bones are brittle, so they tend to break. And in general, it's an enormous cost to society, but it's also a real problem for quality of life as you grow older. So these aren't just trivial academic questions. These are questions that really could have an effect on society. So let's look at how, what happens when a muscle is injured and regenerates. As you know from my previous lectures, We've talked about these stem cells called satellite cells that sit within the muscle bed. They're normally quiescent, but when muscle is injured, they're induced to proliferate by activating signals. And this allows them to produce more cells that can then replace the tissue that is damaged or lost. So that repair occurs, and in fact, the muscle is as good as new. So the question then is, does this um, effective replacement during aging um, change? And the answer is, it does. This graph shows the number of satellite cells in fibers in mice that are 3 to 4 months old up to 28 to 33 months old. Now for those of you who aren't mouse specialists, I can tell you that a 28 to 33 months old mouse is a real geriatric mouse, about 85 years old. That mouse is not moving fast. And if you see the number of satellite cells in their fibers, Perhaps that's a clue why that is. So we can then conclude, at least for a mammal, that older muscle has fewer stem cells. And if that's the case, then perhaps we just can't replenish our muscles as effectively. But there's a bit of a conundrum in this, because in fact, if a muscle stem cell, a satellite cell, is removed from a young muscle fiber, as you see in the top panels, in the middle there is a little nucleus that's lit up to show that that is, in fact, a stem cell nucleus, not a regular muscle nucleus. If that muscle satellite cell is removed from the muscle and is put in a dish and allowed to proliferate slowly but surely, it will make muscle. And it doesn't do it any better or worse than an old satellite cell. So there's something about the capacity to make muscle that appears to be retained even though these cells are less in number. However, that's not the only thing that a satellite cell has to do. It has to actually respond to injury, and it has to proliferate. 
So are there changes in the capacity of these satellite cells to do that job? And for this, we turn to a number of different well-known signaling mechanisms within the muscle system. In this case, we're going to talk about one such signaling mechanism that has actually been associated with aging because it declines an old muscle. And that's the notch delta signaling mechanism. So I'll tell you in detail how it works, but first, the reason that it was considered was it's required for proper formation of the first skeletal muscle in the embryo, and it's also important in regulating satellite cells in the adult. And it has been shown to decline an old muscle. So what is the notch delta signaling pathway? And could it be a clue to the decrease in the capacity for skeletal muscle to regenerate as we get older? So here's a picture of what notch delta looks like. Notch delta consists of two subunits. Both are membrane-associated proteins. Both have a little part of them that sticks outside of the cell and another part inside. Delta is in the top in the satellite cell in this particular picture, and notch is in the bottom. These are both receptors in the sense that they receive signals. And the way they do that is to interact. When they interact, there's a, a relay of events, which includes clipping the two sides of the dumbbell of notch apart so that that pink part, the intracellular part, can move to the nucleus and start transcription of RNA. So in that case, we have a way of telling the cell on the outside to do something on the inside. And that's exactly what signaling does. In a young muscle, after injury, we find a very robust increase in the number of delta molecules sitting on those satellite cells. And that is probably the reason why, in fact, satellite cells are so responsive to injury, because they increase the signaling, rev it up, and, and are able, therefore, to go into another proliferative round. And interestingly, in old muscle, that response is absent, so that the delta increase doesn't show up. Now, in some real-life pictures from Tom Rando and his colleagues, here you see what muscle, young and old, looks like after it's been injured, as it pertains to the notch delta signaling system. On the left is a young muscle that's been injured, and the injured fibers here are artificially lighted up in a sort of pink-yellow scheme. And you can see that the same injured cells are in the old, but there's a difference. No green. What's the green? Green is delta. So delta is being highly upregulated in the entire vicinity of the injury in a young animal, but somehow that response is absent in the old animal. Now, again, this is one of these observations where you could say, well, this is an obscure set of receptors that's interacting, and it changes during aging. How do we know it has any causation? Maybe it's just going along for the ride. Now, in order to, to test for that, scientists have to perturb the system. So we have to change something about notch delta signaling and see if that changes the way the muscle can regenerate. And that's exactly what Tom Rando and his colleagues did with some very clever tricks. First of all, I have to explain that there are ways in which you can inhibit the notch signaling pathway as well as increasing the notch signaling pathway. And I won't go into the details of how we do this, but just suffice it to say that if you treat a muscle with an inhibitor and you injure that muscle in a young animal, you see that in the top left panel, a normal muscle starts to uh, degenerate in a way that is much, much more uh, reminiscent of what an old muscle looks like if you inhibit notch. That is to say, if you compare the inhibition of notch in a young animal, it looks much more like the way an old animal responds to injury. That's in the lower left. Now, let's say we, in, in a complementary study, we activate notch. Can we actually turn an old muscle into a young muscle in its capacity to regenerate? And the answer is we can. So here you see that an old muscle is looking much, much more like a regular young muscle in its regenerative capacity. So these sorts of experiments begin to give us clues as to what molecular changes are going on during muscle aging and how we might intervene in those changes. Now, finally, I'd like to talk about the possibility that the stem cells have their own intrinsic problems during aging 
but the environment is aging as well. So the question here is, if we change the environment of an aging tissue, will the resident cells in that tissue respond in a different way? Let's look again at what happens in an injured muscle. In a young injured muscle, we have a very robust signal that seems to go through the entire muscle, activating the satellite cells. It involves notch, it involves a lot of other things as well. And what that does is produce, in the end, a proliferation of the stem cells. In the older muscle, a similar injury is capable of in, in activating those same uh, responses, but they're blunted in some way, as if there was some negative damping down of the response to regenerate. And in that case, what you see then is less satellite cells. So would it be possible that there is a, an environmental effect here on the way these satellite cells are responding? And could there be some way that we could expose the young muscle to an old environment and the old muscle to a young environment? Now, short of transplanting muscles from young animals into old animals, which doesn't really give you that much information, Tom Rando came up with a very ingenious scheme. In this case, he asked the question, where's the fountain of youth? Is the young animal capable of reprogramming old muscle to respond to injury in a more effective way? Or is it possible that the old animal, if exposed to um, a young environment, will actually in some way damp down the capacity for the young muscle to regenerate? To do this, he made parabiotic pairings between mice of different ages. Now, how this works is a small suture is made in the side of the animal's skin. In both cases, in these pairs, they are sutured together as if they were mini Siamese twins. Not their whole body, but just a small portion of their body is connected. At this point, what happens is that the circulation of the two animals begins to run into each other. And eventually, after a couple of days of this, the animals actually share the same circulation. Now, they share the same blood cells, but they also share all of the factors that are floating around in the serum of your blood. And the question then can be asked, what happens if you injure the young animal or the old animal in these what we call heterochronic pairings or partners? So I'm going to show you a complicated slide which uh, gives the answer to this question. And although it's complicated, it has a, a real uh, dramatic punchline here. So let's go through it very quickly. We're going to look first at the capacity for a young mouse to sustain injury when exposed to a young mouse's environment. That's a control, because in fact we assume nothing's going to change. And in fact, if you see at the top, you're beginning now to be muscle experts, you can tell that that muscle there is actually regenerating pretty well. Now at the bottom, you see a stain for red, and red means new muscle forming. So where you see red on the lower panel, that means regeneration is occurring. So this is just a very easy way to see whether there are going to be changes. Now you see here that if you injure the young animal and the, the young animal is partnered with the old animal, it doesn't seem to affect the young animal. The young animal continues to be able to regenerate just as well. Now let's look at an old animal who is paired with another old animal. Again, another control which tells us that the actual procedure itself isn't changing anything about the way in which these animals can regenerate. The punchline is here. If the old animal is injured when paired with a young animal, it regains the capacity to regenerate its muscle. So that's pretty astounding. That means that there's something about the young animal's environment which is affecting the old animal. Okay, so the obvious answer you're all thinking, I'm sure, is, well, that's easy. They're just stem cells in the young animal that are going over into the old animal and doing the job. I mean, that's the obvious answer to this. So in order to test for this, um, we uh, look in detail at the capacity for the young animal to actually both inactivate the, uh, activate the notch pathway and to deliver cells to the old animal. So first what we're going to see here is that in fact the notch pathway is activated in old animal cells if cultured in a dish with young animal serum. 
Now, the serum does not have any cells in it. It's just the stuff that your blood floats, your blood cells float around in. It's full of factors, and those factors are capable of activating the notch pathway in the old stem cells. So that tells us that it's probably not cells. And here's just the data to suggest that that's the case. Here you're looking at young cells on the left with serum from young and old, same number of notch positive cells. The old cells that are exposed to either young or old serum either have less notch as we see in the previous slide, but they also have the capacity to activate notch with young serum. Now, finally, in a real proof of concept in the actual animal, you can mark the cells in the young animal by using a transgenic animal. And that allows you to follow the cells if they do move over at all. So the way we do this is to use a young animal that has a green fluorescent protein transgene in every one of its cells. And then we look in the old animal after injury and see whether, in fact, there are any green cells in that old animal. And the answer is there are not. So although the cells are moving around, those muscle cells are actually controlling the regeneration of the old animal's injury in response to young factors. So before we take questions then, we'll just review what we've seen so far. We can attribute some of the de uh, decrement in function in aging to decreased number of cells, at least in skeletal muscle. Those cells don't work as well, and the environment in which they find themselves is not as conducive. So probably what we're looking at here is a mixture of different factors. Lower stem cells, worse environment. And we're now poised in the field to ask the questions, if we change the environment, can we change the number of stem cells? Can we actually rejuvenate ourselves if we understand more about the fountain of youth, the famous fountain of youth, which appears to be floating around in all of your bloodstreams and less so in mine? So. <laughs> Obviously, we'd love to know what are those factors, and now we're in a wonderful position to be able to answer that question with a systematic approach. We have a test, and we have a question in which we can couch that test. So finally, then we can ask the question for our next part of the talk, are there factors that we already know about that could perhaps be some of these candidate factors, and are there ways in which we can improve both the capacity to regenerate our own tissues, but also perhaps to improve the capacity for stem cell therapy to work better in older people. And I'll stop there, and I'll take questions. Yes? I was wondering how um, muscle fibers actually know if they're injured or not, in, in a molecular sense. Well, that's a very good question, and um, the problem is, is that this is um, a field that I love, and so you're going to have to stop me from warbling on. And therefore, what I'm going to say in a very short, uh, hopefully succinct answer is that there is a mechanical um, uh, effect on muscle, which is to literally destroy cells. And when cells are burst apart, there is an immediate response in the surrounding tissue of any organ. Um, and what happens, among other things, is that signals are sent out from that injured area to call in um, important other cells from the bloodstream, such as the inflammatory cells, the cells that might be there who need to actually clean up the mess to take away the dead cells and make sure that those dead cells are appropriately degraded, and to couch, if this is a surface wound, to somehow close it to keep it from getting infected. Each one of those populations of cells that comes into the area is a potent source of factors itself. So what we're trying to figure out now is what are the factors that are coming from the injured tissue versus what are the factors that are coming from the cells that are coming in to help clean up the mess. Just like that. Concentration. Yes, I'm, I'm going to save this one for you. Right. Um, why is that despite the lower amount of stem cell contribution that the the amount of regeneration is the same. In which case? Like, uh, um, the chart we had a decreasing, triangle decreasing amount of cell contribution. That's right. 
have inflammation in the... Oh, I'm sorry, in that middle part, in those middle, in those middle tissues. Um, we believe that those tissues have been somehow programmed to be able to regenerate because they're constantly in very heavy use. So if you think about the two tissues that were mentioned, skeletal muscle and liver, that are in that... These are tissues that are not in high turnover mode. That is to say, they're not actually being sloughed off the way the intestine or the skin is, but they are also prone to injury. In the case of liver, it's because of toxins or waste products that could actually injure the cells. In the case of muscle, you actually injure your muscle when you go to the gym. That's why it's highly not recommended. But at any rate, you can actually feel no pain, no gain. That is injury. And that means that your muscle has to have a way to rejuvenate itself. However, we believe that in those cases, the amount of turnover is not as great as it is in things like the skin. And therefore, we're just in a sort of an intermediate stage. But this is somewhat of a hypothetical um, uh, gradation. And obviously, each, uh, each tissue type has a different way of doing this uh, repair process. OK? And this one's the easy one. Yes? If we do happen to make the old muscle cells look young by changing their environment or by just changing or putting the like, young cells into the old cells, um, wouldn't it be like most likely that it would just relapse back into the way it was before we changed its environment just because cells are so just comfortable with their uh, beginning environment? Well, if in fact the argument is that the environment can change the cell, or perhaps the better way to say it is that the cell has no intrinsic reason not to be able to respond to the environment, not to be able to turn on its notch signaling pathway, or to proliferate in the way that it needs to do. Um, clearly, uh, the minute that we, sew, uh, w that we s take out the stitches and separate those two mice, the old mouse will go back to being weak again. There's no question about it. So this is not a solution. Do not get any old person to allow you to suture yourself to them. <laughs> Because you'd have to stay there for the rest of your life, and you'd get old too, and then it wouldn't work anymore. So basically, um, we're looking to think about ways to use that proof of principle to isolate the molecules involved. Now, those molecules might be things that we can actually deliver as therapeutics in a much more consistent and lengthy way to stave off some of the problems associated with aging. The lady with the dark jacket and the red scarf around her neck. Um, um, I've heard of a disease, um, I'm not sure what it's called, um, but it's where young kids get really, they age really fast, and um, but they, like, their, their age is still the same and their personality is like, it has really, um, it's like still young, but um, don't they still keep their stem cells from like, um, since they were young, or do they also lose their... Mm. That's a really good question, and this is a, a very rare but extremely uh, distressing sort of disease called progeria in which there is premature aging. And in fact, um, the, progeria, the progeria phenotype is one that has been actually modeled in animals, um, looking for ways in which to induce premature aging in a mouse to try to understand what it is about humans that th with these, these afflictions that we can understand and perhaps cure. And um, it's a long and complex field and would be a wonderful uh, subject of another Howard Hughes lecture, but I'll leave it to say that um, we're basically at the point where we know a little bit about the disease. It's multifaceted, and stem cells in certain cases are involved. So I think I'm afraid I've been told to move on to the second half of the lecture. And so I'll obviously take more questions after that. So I'm going to finish this lecture series with a major challenge, and that is to address the issue of how we might be able to regenerate an organ that we all depend on minute by minute, but that is one of the most intractable organs to regenerate in our entire body, and that's the heart. So the heart, of course, as you know, is a very complex organ that forms very early in development 
and continues to function throughout our lives. And yet if you find it on our chart here, you see that it is one of the lowest regenerating tissues in mammals and it has some of the lowest cell turnover outside of the brain. Now, what is uh, the function of a heart? Well, it's a pump, and it pumps in two different ways. Seen here in the animation, we're going to first look at the right ventricle atrium connection in which cells are being brought out of the low oxygen starved body and pumped into the lungs. And if we look at the right hand side of the heart, oxygen rich cells are being brought out of the lungs and pumped back into the body. And if we look at the two sets of two chambers together, we see this marvelous coordination which allows us to take our blood out of our body and put it back into our body in a completely different oxygen state. So with that kind of extraordinarily important function, which goes on from the minute you start to be a human being somewhere in that embryogenic uh, gray zone, when your heart starts to beat, till the day you die, that you can't miss a beat. Well, a few, but that's about all. And so that heart has to go on and on and on. And would you think that that would be the one place that would be full of stem cells? And yet, it's not. It's so bad that when people get heart attacks, which means a cessation of uh, the function of the heart due to an injury, it's often a lethal, eventually, a lethal condition. So what is a heart attack? So I'm going to show you on this little, on this little model here. So that's about the size of a human heart, about the size of your fist. And the two chambers that we saw before are more or less here, the two big chambers that essentially drive your heart. And if you see how much muscle there is, it's a bulging muscle. I mean, it's essentially all muscle. It has to be because it's a pump. It's pumping and pumping. The only way that you can keep this heart in th this incredibly uh, ready state where it can give a beat every minute or every, well, give 60 beats a minute or whatever it is, <laughs> is if these veins and arteries called the coronary circulation are fully open and operating. So the heart not only pumps for the body, it pumps for itself. And the way it does so is to take a little bit of blood out of the highly oxygenated uh, blood that's coming through the aorta and divert it into its own muscle to hold that muscle in a state of eternal readiness to, to work. Now, if there is any problem with this circulation, you essentially deprive the heart muscle of oxygen. And as you know, without oxygen, tissues can't live. And so a heart attack is usually caused by a problem in one of your arteries. So assume that this is then one of your arteries running through your heart. This artery is probably my artery after having spent five years in Italy eating too much rich food. Namely, all of this yellow stuff in here is called plaque. And it's a collection of cholesterol which builds up in the inner sides of your blood vessels over time. And this can be a genetic cause or it can be a lifestyle cause. But at some point during this period, there's the danger that some kind of a rupture can occur through some kind of a mechanical injury in that plaque and blood can flow out into your blood vessel that actually causes, because it's an injury, a clot. And that clot, to close the injury against the outside, which is in fact the blood vessel, can dislodge and get stuck in one of these descending arteries right here. And then what happens is that you see what we call an infarct. On the left here, you see the blocked artery has caused an area of damage, shown here as a sort of black smudge. What's going on there? The dying myocytes, shown in purple, are, of course, n not able to contract anymore. And the ones that are surviving around the side try to divide, but myocytes aren't very good at dividing. And what happens eventually is that the scar tends to actually grow. And the reason it grows is that the, the myocytes around the scar start to expand and become larger and hypertrophic because they have to still do the same job for the whole heart that that healthy part did. 
yet those larger myocytes eventually get to the point where they can't get any bigger, and yet the heart is still having to pump, at which point they actually end up dying. So what eventually happens is that this original, often rather minor injury that people don't even know happened, then turns into a major problem because the heart starts to fail. It cannot actually pump anymore, and then you have heart failure. Now, this is a really important problem in the Western world, and obviously it's something that many people have considered as a prime target for therapy, and particularly stem cell therapy, because we are looking at a loss of tissue. That's exactly what a heart attack gives you. It gives you the loss of the myocardium. However, scientists, biologists, have noted for a long time that this incapacity for the mammalian heart to regenerate is in fact not something that it shares with some of the lower organisms. And here we see again regenerative capacity on the left and evolutionary scale on the right. And again, we see that some of our lower vertebrate cousins can do a much better job. So let's have a look at this, the fish. The fish is capable of regenerating its heart in the most remarkable way. And for that, we're going to see a video. Zebrafish, which any of you who are fish fanciers keep in the, in the fish tank, can get to be about two inches long. It's got a little heart with just two chambers, one atrium and one ventricle, and that pumps blood throughout the whole body past the gills, which are the equivalent of the lung in a fish. The heart is very muscular, just like our heart. Inside, there are very thick muscular walls that allow the heart to effectively pump throughout this very um, complex series of, of veins. Now, let's see what happens <clears throat> if we cut off the tip of the heart. Ouch! Ow! Don't worry, the fish is okay. It's okay. The fish immediately closes up that wound. Within seconds, the clotting process starts up. Now, in our heart, what would happen is there'd be a big clot, and eventually that clot would essentially heal over, but nothing more would happen. But Ken Poss and his co-workers have recently noted that, aside from the fact that there are cells within the zebrafish myocardium in the red muscle that can actually activate like satellite cells and start to divide to make new muscle, there's also this slowly proliferating, engulfing layer of single cells on the outside of the heart called the epicardium, which is um, a mad, really a magic layer of cells because it engulfs the whole scar area. And then, in a really remarkable series of events that recapitulate developmental biology of the heart, a series of growth factors, in this case a growth factor called fibroblast growth factor, is produced by the heart as it's regenerating, and this fibroblast growth factor, or FGF, docks into epicardial cells set on the edge of the heart, and those epicardial cells, with this signal, know to march into the myocardium. So there they are, marching in. Now, the next thing they do, obviously now we're in a macroscopic picture, is a very important, absolutely fundamental part of, of making new muscle, which is to vascularize it. So with the new veins in there, the fish ends up with a brand new heart with new muscle, and not only new muscle, but all of the appropriate coronary vasculature to innervate it. And the fish can actually survive in some way. So we can't do that. But boy, boy, would we like to be able to do that. I mean, I don't want my heart cut up, but if it ever happened, I'd like to be able to swim away like that. Now, what's the difference between fish and mammals, really, then? Well, let's just look at it from a very simplistic point of view. Hearts can regenerate with tissue replacement in a fish. Several different layers of cells seem to be involved. There seem to be stem cells within the myocardium, and then this magical layer that is the origin of the coronary vasculature in development for the heart, seems to recapitulate that same program and become, again, capable of making new blood vessels. In the human, heart failure is caused by tissue loss and no replacement. So what are the possible ways that we could address this problem? Well, we could study the fish, and that's exactly what people are doing. What makes it so possible for a fish to be able to do this? We can't wait as human beings to understand exactly what's happening in the fish. We'd like to be able to start treating the patients who are in the clinics right now. 
Can we replace heart cells to treat the disease? Well, this idea actually has its origins in some very intriguing observations early on in heart transplant medical practice. So in a transplant, a truly failed heart that can no longer work is removed, and a healthy heart from a donor is put in its place. And you literally sew the veins and the, and the arteries onto the new heart, and the new heart can function more or less as the old heart did. This is a very complex procedure. It's very expensive, and it, the problem is there aren't that many hearts floating around to use for the many, many people who need them. Nevertheless, the fact is that when you put a heart into a foreign host, you can ask interesting questions about that heart. Does that heart get any cells from the host? Does it incorporate cells from its host? Now, if in fact the heart that was put into a patient comes from a female into a male patient, the male patient in each one of his cells has a Y chromosome that the whole heart that was transplanted does not. So scientists have probes that we can use to show whether a cell has a Y chromosome or not. And so we can actually then go into autopsy situations after the patient has eventually died and look at that transplanted heart that often was living in that patient, that female's heart was living in that male patient, could be for decades, and look to see whether there were any male cells that ended up in the female heart. And miraculously, there are quite a few. So this means that a normal functioning heart can actually pick up cells from its environment. So if that's the case, how is it doing it? Is it picking it up from neighboring vas vessels? Or is it picking it up from the bone marrow? Because of course the bone marrow is full of male cells and the blood's going through the female heart every day. We just don't know the answer to that, but it suggests that the heart is capable of picking up cells that are circulating. So with that encouraging piece of rather arcane information in hand, scientists have begun to think about how to take stem cells from a patient, namely bone marrow stem cells, from a patient that's healthy in their bone marrow but has a horrendously failed heart and see if they can actually help the patient that way. Now remember that these progenitor cells have to do two things that I showed you the zebrafish does effortlessly. Number one, they have to make new muscle cells, and number two, they have to be able to put blood vessels through that muscle to give it the appropriate oxygen. So I'm going to tell you a little bit now about where we stand with these sorts of trials because they're ongoing for patients that have had acute myocardial infarction. And these are uh, trials that are based entirely on bone marrow stem cells from the patient themselves going into themselves. So these are what we call autologous transplants. And uh, these can be uh, extracted from the patient's bone marrow and cultured, purified, depending on the protocol. Some of the trials have used certain subsets of bone marrow cells called endothelial progenitor cells, or EPCs. Others have reasoned that muscle cells might be possibly useful, even though they're not heart, they contract, maybe they would work as well. And these cells are then introduced in various ways into the heart of the patient. Now, in the case of the left-hand protocol, there is an infusion balloon that runs through the aorta down into the patient's heart and delivers the cells that way. So catheterization of the circulation in human patients is something that is very, very well understood and is quite uh, routine. Alternatively, you can use needle injection with a catheter and a flexible needle so that you can actually put the cells into the myocardial wall or you can just open up the patient's chest and jam the cells in, Pulp Fiction style. Now, <laughs> I'm going to tell you about one very recent trial. It was just published about a month and a half ago in which that first method was used, intracoronary infusion. In this case, the patient was an uh, acute myocardial infarction patient, heart attack recent patient, comes into the clinic and is chosen to go either into a placebo group or into the group that's going to get the cells. So what this means, and it's, it, these, these are very complicated trials to set up because you also have to blind all the people who are doing the trial to whether the patient is getting cells or just serum, just, you know, saline. Because you might be able to pick up all sorts of effects based on perception. And so you want to get rid of all of that. So these are now trials that are called double-blinded placebo-controlled trials. 
These trials mean that many patients come in, some of them are secretly in a, in a placebo group, some of them are secretly in the group that's going to get the cells. They're all treated as any patient should be treated for myocardial infarction, but there's just this added extra treatment. And then the question is what happens? Now this was a trial, a very large trial, and many patients were enrolled, and the results just came out, and the answer is encouraging on one level, but a little bit disappointing on another. As you see from the numbers here, patients that received the bone marrow got a 5.5% increase in their function as measured by ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood that is ejected out of your heart. So the better the ejection fraction, the stronger your heart is. Now, of course, some people rec recover spontaneously from heart attacks, and you can see that by the number of the placebo, which is 3%. So a 3% increase in the capacity for the heart to do better was what you would get anyway. Now, this is not going to cure anybody in the long haul. And so clearly, although it's a proof of principle that there is some effect, beneficial effect, we are far from the optimal protocol. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do. So what are the other ways in which we can address this? Maybe we can stimulate the heart itself to make new cells. And if that's the case, maybe that would help us to address the issue. So in our lab, we've tried a technique in mouse to see if that would work. And you're familiar with this story because of the IGF-1 growth factor treatment I told you about yesterday for muscular dystrophy. In this case, we tried the same trick, except we addressed the question of heart regeneration. To do this, we made a mouse that overexpressed this transgenic IGF-1 in the heart. And we did so by injecting a cardiac transgene into the heart of a mouse. And then we followed that mouse as the progeny developed that had the gene expressing this growth factor within the heart. And looked to see whether we had any effect at all on the heart or whether these animals developed abnormally, because we're putting a lot more of this growth factor into these mice, and they have this growth factor from conception onwards. And miraculously, we found that the animals regulated very well. They saw the growth factor, they didn't seem to mind the growth factor. The only thing that we did see is that if you look at these pictures of mouse hearts, as they get older, at two months of age, the mice had slightly larger hearts if they had IGF-1. But it was just a precocious growth to an adult stage because we found larger cells, which in this case was what we expected, but those cells never did anything other than get to the size they normally would be in a six-month-old mouse, and then the mouse seemed totally normal. So on one hand, we were very happy, and on the other hand, we wondered if we had just wasted our time. So we decided to try to mimic a myocardial infarction in a mouse. Now, mice actually don't like McDonald's, they don't eat rich food, it's really hard to get them to go into some sort of atherosclerosis. Um, they're not really fond of high cholesterol, they like carrots and like Doug. And they, um, therefore, ha you have to do something else. So what we do is we put a little string around the, or the coronary artery and tie it down a bit as if there was a clot in there. And that gives them the equivalent of a myocardial infarction as seen on the right. Now, we then can follow to see whether the animals that have the growth factor do better than the animals without. So on the left, you see a mouse heart that looks normal with a ventricle, the big left ventricle, in a cross section. And on the right, you see a control um, in which we opened up the mouse and gave it a myocardial infarction, closed it up and waited for a couple of months and then looked at it again. And you can see that this mouse has very nasty heart failure. That thin wall is exactly what patients look like after they've had a myocardial infarction and waited a long time. Now, a myocardial infarction, the same myocardial infarction technique on one of these animals that we had engineered to express the growth factor didn't appear to have the same response at all. And as you can see in the lower left-hand panel, there was a rather miraculous recovery. In fact, it reminded us, perhaps hopefully, of the way the zebrafish regenerates. And so we believe then that the way in which the growth factor works is somehow to retain some of the tricks of evolution that we've lost and go back to being able to regenerate the heart. And if you look at the actual cellular basis of this, I've done it as a cartoon here, 
on the left, you're familiar with this picture. It's a scar. It's, it's going to eventually cause problems for this mouse. On the right, we have brand new cells. We have a vessel going through it. And essentially, we're on our way to a complete recovery. Now, how could IGF-1 be helping? Well, one thing that we noticed is that IGF-1 overexpressing animals appeared to express a number of molecules that we associate with homing. And there are growth factors and all sorts of other ways in which we can find uh, tracts of cells that are preferentially drawn to regions of injury. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw, that these attractive molecules called chemokines were expressed at quite high levels in these animals. Finally, before I finish, I'd like to just mention a very, very new result, literally two weeks old. So I threw these slides together literally over the last two days to show them to you, because I think it's very exciting and it brings home a point that warms the cockles of my heart. And that is a, an experiment that was done by Paul Riley recently in which he tested the capacity for a molecule called thymus in beta-4, which is actually a molecule that helps cells rearrange their cytoskeleton, their shape, to help with the capacity for a mammalian mouse heart to regenerate. And what he found, in a word, was that injecting this molecule into the mouse's heart created a much better environment. In fact, it looked a bit like what happened when we overexpressed the IGF-1 gene. And when he looked in detail at how this actually occurred, it was uh, really astounding because the thymus in beta-4 was activating that epicardial layer, just like the zebrafish does. And so it appeared that we were beginning to have a pathway here that we could actually start to imagine looks like a zebrafish regeneration pathway that we could artificially induce in a human heart. So we imagined that thymus in beta-4 might activate the epicardium to make new blood vessels, we know that FGF is another factor that we can deliver that might actually then turn those newly, newly activated epicardial cells into cells that can actually make blood vessel cells, endothelial cells. And eventually then, hopefully, we can understand how with the IGF-1 gene, we might be able to build new, blood, uh, build new heart muscle itself. So in fact, we believe that there might be ways in which we can replace cells we might be able to stimulate the heart to make new cells, and we can even keep it alive by improving the way in which the hearts revascularize their tissue using this rather amazingly reminiscent uh, uh, protocol that looks for all the world like a protocol that the zebrafish has used by definition. Anyway, just to finish off then, here are some of the ways in which cells might be used to cure heart disease. And in many ways, you can think of many organs standing in for this heart, because the ideas are the same. The ideas come from the possibility for cells within the tissue itself to regenerate, and how can we activate those. Cells that might be available that we're not even aware of within a tissue that could be cajoled into helping out. And finally, cells that might come in secreting different factors that could help us to uh, convince the heart that it actually could regenerate in a better way. Now, before I close and take questions, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge the fact that I have a rather extraordinary group of people to thank, which are my own lab. And I have to tell you that they're watching this from Italy. They called me yesterday and told me that I was a disgrace for the t-shirt episode. <laughs> and that if I didn't do better, I wasn't allowed back. But I mean, in all honesty, that they've been wonderful in letting me out of school for a couple of days to come and talk to you. And um, it's really a pleasure to have uh, young people in our laboratories who get as excited about science as we do. And I'd just like to acknowledge all those wonderful people in a rather salubrious environment in the small trattoria in Rome. And now I'll take questions. Yes. Um, with heart transplants, do blood types still play an important role in that? With heart transplants, blood types do play an important role. And in fact, uh, the capacity to, with, uh, to hold on to a transplanted heart is largely dependent on how well that heart is matched at a number of immune levels. So um, 
Thanks all very much, and I'm going to now turn the podium over. Nadia, thanks for another great lecture. I want to thank everyone for a very successful holiday lecture series. Thanks to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute staff, to our production team, especially to you, the student audience, for all of your great questions. And let's have one more round of applause for our terrific speakers. Now, how, how about next year? Well, our topic for next year's holiday lecture series is HIV and the global AIDS epidemic. Hughes investigator Bruce Walker from Harvard Medical School will be joined by his colleague Visala Ojikutu from South Africa. And they will present four lectures talking about how the AIDS epidemic got started, what the virus is like, how it became an epidemic, and what we can do in terms of prevention and treatment. So we hope to see all of you next year. Until then, have a great holiday season.